Hey everyone, and welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your questions. I'm Ashley Mova, and if you've got a question that you want answered on air, you can send it over anytime to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. You could get it answered on Mailbag, or you could get it answered on Movie Talk. And sitting with me to answer those questions right now is the editor in chief of AMC Movie News, John Campia. Hey, how you doing? It's Oscar Day. It's Oscar Day. It's Oscar Day. So excited for that. And listen, guys, don't forget, uh, if you don't follow us on Instagram, Instagram right now, or if you don't have an Instagram account, account number one, sign up for Instagram. <laughs> number two, make sure you're following AMC Movie News on Instagram because tonight the whole crew, all of AMC Movie News, we're going to be watching the Oscars together. We're going to do a little pre-show of the Oscars and we're going to do a big post-show, but all throughout the Oscars, we're going to be posting like little video reactions on our Instagram throughout the night. So make sure you're following us in there and keep up to date and interact with us uh, during the Oscars tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited. Me too. Andrew Meeks writes, hi guys, love the show. Still been watching for over a year. My question is about Star Wars. Is it true that Ryan Johnson is taking over 8 and 9 instead of Abrams doing all three? And do you guys believe that this is a smart move by Disney to replace J.J. for the finishing films? Thanks, guys, and may the force be with you. Uh, as far as I know, yeah. As far as I know, Ryan Johnson, uh, the guy who did Looper, I, I, for, I love him. He's a just a great sci-fi mind mm-hmm. to start with and a great narrative mind. He's a terrific director. As far as I know, he is on to do uh, episodes 8 and episode 9. Is it a good move for them to move away from JJ? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. And it's a good move for JJ too. Look, I, I have said this for a long time. I don't believe directors should stay on franchises for a long time. Um, I think you need to keep you know, these franchises fresh, and that means introducing new directors now and again. That doesn't mean you can't do one or two, whatever, but that's one of the reasons why I don't think Joss Whedon is going to come back for Mm -hmm. an Avengers 3. I think he needs to recharge his creative batteries, get involved and do other types of films. And I think a director like J.J. Abrams, not only would he want to step away from Star Wars after being just completely wrapped up in the Star Wars process for two or three years by the time the movie comes out, to not want to jump right back in and start the whole thing again with a yet another Star Wars movie. He needs to step away, do another type of project, another type of film, get his creative batteries recharged, all that kind of stuff. I so therefore I think it's great for, you know, a Star Wars franchise to bring in a new director like Ryan Johnson as long as it's a great director mm-hmm. and they've got a great director. And it's good for JJ to step away. And remember too, the original 3 Star Wars movies, contrary to popular belief, the original 3 Star Wars movies were not all directed by George Lucas. George Lucas directed the first Star Wars, and then he handed it off to his USC like professor uh, in Kirshner to direct Empire Strikes Back, and then they got another director to direct Return of the Jedi. Now, was George Lucas in charge? Absolutely he was. He was the one kind of steering the whole ship, but the original trilogy was not directed all by the same guy. There are exceptions to the rule, obviously. Steven Spielberg directed all three, and I say three. There are not four. The all the three Raiders of the Lost Ark films and that turned out great. Peter Jackson directed all the Lord of the Rings films. That's sure, absolutely that that happens. Um, so there are exceptions to it, absolutely. But I do believe this is a good move for Star Wars, and I like how they're going to switch up directors and bring in different directors for all the standalone movies too. I think that's going to keep things fresh. I think that's going to guarantee that each film has its own unique feel. Because once again, if you go back to Star Wars. Empire Strikes Back, while a clear continuation and a clear sequel to Star Wars. It very much had its own uniqueness to it. It had its very own a unique tone to it because it was a different guy at the helm. Same thing with the Turn of the Jedi. And that's one of the things that makes those movies so special, I think. So I think this is a good movie for a uh, good move for JJ, and I think this is a good move for Star Wars too. Um, do you think that let's say if people don't like the way eight episode eight mm. turns out, are they gonna look for someone else then? It will be tough but not impossible. Yeah. yeah if let's say episode eight they get into episode eight, and by the time they're done finished shooting, the studio says, this is horrible. And they look at it and think, this is rotten, and Ryan Johnson doesn't know how to handle a big, big mm-hmm. budget. This will clearly be the biggest mm-hmm. budget film he's ever done. And they say, oh, it just wasn't in the cards. Ryan Johnson is better suited to smaller, uh, lower budget films where he can work his magic. I don't think that's, that's not going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen at all. Mm-hmm. But if it did... Absolutely. Uh, Lucasfilm can pull the trigger and say, you know what, we're going to, it's not too late. We're going to pull trigger and, and change out directors. Mm-hmm. But I think that's unlikely. Okay. 
John D'Alessandro writes, Hey guys, I was watching your show the other day about Shazam and how with all the attention The Rock is bringing to the movie. No one has announced who Shazam would be or whether he's teasing and he's actually Shazam, leaving Black Adam to still be filled. My question is, do you think that Dave Bautista would be the person to do this? Everyone is waiting to see if he is a success first. He seems like a better Black Adam since he has been playing the villain, the good guy. Maybe he wants to get a little more diverse what are your thoughts and thanks for taking my question well i mean number one the rock is playing black adam mm. like he he was clear about that the studio's clear about that they obviously have some cool plans for black adam to make the rock play mm. that character and that's one of the reasons to be excited for it is that they have a big plan for their villain so that's great so no i i do not believe i don't believe this is a ruse i mean who know anything's possible anything is possible but I, do, I don't believe that's the case at all uh the rock said he's gonna be black adam it was always reported long before that, that he was going to play Black Adam years ago too. So he's going to be Black Adam. The role they need to fill is Shazam. So let's look at the one name you brought up in, in Dave Batista. I love Dave Batista. I think that dude is one of the most grounded, sincere, honest dudes in this business. And, you know, he, he actually participated in our 24-hour um, uh, Philippine disaster mm -hmm. relief marathon that we did. He was very kind to donate some of his time and sent in a video for us to use, which is just great. He's awesome. And one of the things that makes him so awesome is that he will tell you, he has told us, and he will say this right to you, look, I'm not a great actor. <laughs> He'll tell you that. He'll say that right out. Now, is he getting better and better as he goes? Sure he is. But he is still a wrestler who's doing some acting. He's not an actor yet. And he'll be the first guy to tell you that, which I think is why he's been so smart with his career, because he's realistic about where he is. And that, that's why I'm real excited to see where he's going to be five mm -hmm. years from now. But he'll tell you, and he has told me straight up in interviews before, you know, I'm not that great of an actor. I've been really blessed to get certain roles that fit what I can bring. So for like a Mr. Dennis, what do they call, what's his character's name, Inspector in the new James Bond? Is it Mr. Hinks? Let me look it up. Yeah, I think it's Hinks. Let me know if I'm right or wrong about it. Just interrupt me and let me know if I'm right or wrong about that. So when it's a Mr. Hinks, you know there's not going to be loads of dialogue. Yeah, Mr. Hinks. It is Mr. Hinks, okay. So he can bring his natural physical yeah. presence, his physical charisma, probably his dry one-liners, stuff like that. He can just bring the things that he's really good at to the table and bring that into the movie to, you know, elevate the character because it's not needed. He's not needed or required to do the heavier acting lifting. He's not required to be the leading man per se, which I don't think he would carry off very well at this point. And he knows that at this point too. So... But to play the lead character of Shazam, that's different. I, I just don't think that's something he is in a position to do at this point. But let's play devil's advocate, advocate for a second. What if they go heavy into the idea of the Billy Batson thing? Where what if a lot of the film, it's the 12 year old kid, it's the 10 year old kid, it's the 15 year old kid, however old they make him. And he's on screen most of the time. And then. For a few scenes in the movie, he goes, Shazam, boom, and suddenly he's Dave Batista. <laughs> well, then that kind of becomes a possibility for Dave Batista. So it all depends on how they're going to handle that. And right now, we just don't have mm -hmm. the answers. So I would say The Rock is playing Black Adam. The idea of Batista as Shazam doesn't work because I don't think Dave can lead a film at this point. But if they handle Shazam in such a way that he's on screen the minority of the time and they limit what it is he has to do as Shazam, then who knows? Anything's possible. The person who sent in the question, his name is John. They said, what if The Rock has thrown us for a loop and he's actually playing Shazam? Has that ever happened in film history where an actor uh, is trying to like leave the audience on edge and comes out and says that they're playing a character that they're not? I The closest thing I can think is when J.J. Abrams got everybody on the Star Trek production to... Um, collaborate his lie and saying, <laughs> oh, no, no, Ben Cumberbatch, he's not playing Khan. No, no, he's not playing Khan at all. And we all saw through it. I mean, we said on this very, the day he said mm -hmm. that, we said, lies. J.J. <laughs> Abram lies. He's absolutely going to be. And a lot of people did too. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, and Ben Cumberbatch played along with it. All the other staff played along with it and, until it became obvious and they couldn't play along anymore. But I honestly can't think of any other situation off the top of my yeah. head where that was the case. I mean, I know, um, for instance, I, I remember when uh, Bradley Cooper said, 
well, this has happened a lot of times. Bradley Cooper said, no, I'm not going to be an A-team. And sure enough, he was an A-team. Mm -hmm. There's stuff like that. But a situation where a big guy in a movie with a famous character yeah. says, I'm playing this character instead of this character. It turns out it was the other way around. Yeah. I can't remember. Plus, that would in today's social media age, mm -hmm. where everybody has a camera on them because its phones all have cameras, that's impossible to mm -hmm. keep under wraps. It's just, it's just impossible to keep that. It's something like like the lead character cameos you can keep those mm -hmm. under wraps, but who the lead character is and all like they just wouldn't be able to keep it a secret. So he's wrong. <laughs> hey, well, look, I I, I think he's wrong, uh -huh. but leave the crack in the door open that anything's possible. Jake Berlin writes, my question is about the first Terminator Genesis trailer. Is it just me or is the trailer music the exact music plus lyrics used in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes trailer slash marketing, specifically the second trailer? For me, as soon as I heard the music, it took me back to Dawn of Apes instead of getting me ready for a new Terminator movie. I've checked a few times and it sounds identical, especially in the beginning. I guess it's just a bit weird to me to see such a big movie rip off music from another big movie, especially especially when a franchise is trying to make a comeback. Just wondering what your guys' thoughts are on this and if this actually happens more than I or we realize. Thanks, guys. Keep up the great work. It happens much more than you realize. Really? And it's it's not it's not ripping off. It, it's not ripping off. Like, for instance, I remember this great trailer to Lord of the Rings Return of the mm -hmm. King. And it's got that... Dun, 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 But that was from Requiem. What was that? Requiem from a Dream. A Re Requiem for a Dream. Mm -hmm. That's from Requiem for a Dream. And that same music has been used in like three or four different movies. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I think it's very epic and whatever. So I, you know, and I remember there's a few things, uh, songs that I pulled up and stuff like that. Uh, that song Power by Kanye West. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember to look it up. That's in the social network trailer. That's in the limitless trailer. That's in broken city trailer. That's in like six different trailers. Uh, if I keep on down my list that I, that I pulled up here, um, baby O'Reilly by the who resident evil attribution trailer, bugs life trailer, making beauty, be beauty trailer, jobs trailer. We go down to a, a piece of music like bad girls by MIA. It's in the heat. It's in for a good time call. It's in like four different mm -hmm. trailers. So yeah, it's music. And songs and scores and stuff like that are often used in many, many, many different mm -hmm. trailers because it's separate from the film. The trailers are separate from the film. So yeah, don't don't be fooled. Um, it, the music you hear in a trailer has probably been used in other trailers before. Um, that's a little bit of hyperbole, but you understand the point. You understand what I'm trying to say. So yeah, no, it's not unusual at all. It happens all the time. I don't notice it as, as much. I mean, like, I don't... Oh, I notice it all the time. Yeah. yeah. Kind of veering from the question... How important do you think music is in movies? Like in horror movies, for example, when you mute the movie, it's just not as scary. I think, especially when you're talking about movies with tension. Yeah. Whether it's dramatic tension, horror tension, whatever. Scores are mm -hmm. super important. Mm -hmm. um, soundtracks... They can be important. They can be, they can be very important. And I think a lot of the times they're just not important at all. But the score, especially in the dramatic pieces or the intensity types of pieces, horrors are a great yeah. example. The scores become characters in the film. Like you think about the scores to Star Wars. You yeah. think about the scores to Raiders of the Lost Ark. You think about the scores in the Lord of the Rings films. You think about the scores in The Godfather. You think about those that iconic music that lives and breathes within the film itself. And those can become really, really key. How important are they to, to trailers? Well, they are important to trailers. And that's why quite oftentimes you'll get music and trailers that are, that are not going to be in the movie whatsoever. Yeah. So because it's just a marketing piece. So keep that in mind. Drew Markham writes, what's going on, guys? Do you think if Heath Ledger was still with us, that he would be considered one of the greats? No. No, I really, really don't. Heath Ledger is one of those actors where while in, in you know, the upper, semi-upper tier, he was one of those actors that when he was firing on all cylinders, mm -hmm. he could give you a great and memorable performance. Obviously, The Dark Knight is the Joker. Yeah. Brokeback Mountain mm -hmm. is another example. And there are a couple more. But at the same time, he was also the type of actor that he was not always able to fire on all cylinders. There are a lot of movies that Heath Ledger did that were not only not great movies, but to be honest and frank, when you look at him, he was not great in. So he was an actor that I would roll the dice with. If I was a producer and making a film and I had the opportunity to put a Heath Ledger in my film, 
yeah, I'd roll the dice on that. Yes, he can turn in a stinker now and again, but he was also capable of in, of Academy Award winning performances when he was really on his game. Um, another guy who's like that is Nicolas Cage. Nicolas Cage will not go down as one of the greats, but when Nicolas Cage is firing on all cylinders and at his peak and doing his best, he is world class. He's an Academy Award winning type of actor. That's what he is. But he's not always firing in all cylinders. So I would say that like Heath Ledger, Nicolas Cage, uh, well, both guys I would put in my movies, both guys I think would be I'd be willing to roll the dice on, all that kind of stuff. Will either of them be known as the greats? Will they be in those conversations with a Leonardo DiCaprio, mm-hmm. with a Robert De Niro, with an Al Pacino, with, you know, those types of names? Nah, nah, he 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 doesn't he simply doesn't belong. Now, had he lived and the tragedy didn't happen and he went on and appeared in 20 more films, is it possible mm-hmm. that he could have evolved where nine times out of 10 he's firing in all cylinders? Sure, anything's possible, but now we're just guessing. Now right. we're just reaching up in the air and, and pulling guesses out of the air. So, um, no, I, I don't think Ledger goes down as one of the greats, but he does go down as giving us one of the great performances, probably the best performance in a comic book movie ever. Is that your favorite Heath Ledger role? I hate to say that it is because it's so stereotypical. But it was But it is. Phenomenal. It's the one he won an Academy Award for and won an Academy Award for justifiably so. It was scary. He he like became that character. Yeah, you lost Heath Ledger in that performance. When you looked at the screen, there was no Heath Ledger. There was only this psychopath. Yeah. And I love that. And you know, one of the things that I loved about the Joker, nobody talks about this. Mm -hmm. We've brought it up a couple of times is that... The, one of the great things about his performances as the Joker was that wasn't the Joker in any incarnation we've ever seen him for. That was not the comic book Joker. That was not, that was his own Joker. He took that Joker role. He made a character that was his own. And that was one of the great things about that performance. So as stereotypical as it is, as much as it sounds like a cop out. Yeah, Heath Ledger's The Joker is my favorite Heath Ledger yeah. performance. I don't blame you. Dylan Payton writes, Hey guys, I love your show so much. I was wondering who would win in a fight, Neo from The Matrix or John Wick? It all depends. I love this question. <laughs> it all depends on one very important question. Where does the fight happen? Uh, okay. Because if the fight happens in the real world, then John Wick kicks his ass seven times left to sideways. I mean, there's just, yeah, Neo doesn't make Come it on, past. Neo's an OG, though. And he like... doesn't make it past second five. <laughs> He's dead before second five. Now, that being said, if the fight happens in the Matrix, well, then Neo is a, he's a superhero. He has superpowers. He has reality bending powers. So, I, no, I mean, the, the, that it doesn't matter how good John Wick is. He ain't, he can't bend time, space, and reality. Right. Neo destroys him in that world. So it all depends on where the fight happens. If it's in the real world, John Wick easily. In the Matrix, Neo easily. I wish there was a movie that we could actually find the result that of this. That would be but... interesting. That would be like a new version of Freddy versus Jason. <laughs> exactly. John Wick versus Neo. I'd be in for it. <laughs> Craig Farkas writes, congratulations on all the Phase 3 opportunities. I'm looking forward to all the new shows. Does Phase 3 now mean that Movie Talk can be moved to an hour-long show? It's my favorite daily show. Yes, it does mean that AMC Movie Talk can be moved to an hour-long show. It can be moved to a three-hour-long show. It can be moved to a seven-hour show, (laughs) but it's not going to um, for a couple of reasons. But it it means that we don't have to hold so hard and fast to the half-hour rule Mm -hmm. because, you know, as of right now, our wonderful partners at the stream.tv, we've been so lucky to shoot our shows there for the past year and a half, and they've been great partners and whatever, but it is their studio and they have other things going on. And therefore, this has happened a number of times. We hit the 30 minute mark and we haven't even got to viewer questions yet. And we've got people in the studio going, <laughs> rap, they start doing the rap, wrap it up. I actually got mad at them once. I don't know if you were there that time. I actually got mad. I probably plugged that. my ears. Um, but anyway, yeah. So because they have other things that they need to do, they have staff, they have other shows coming in. And so what, what it does mean because we're moving into our own studios and our own headquarters is that now when we hit that 30 minute mark, if we're not done, we don't have to just rush it through and wrap it yeah. up. We can take our time. So we are still going to aim for say the 35 minute mark. Mm -hmm. We're gonna aim for 35 minutes. But having your own space means if it goes over, 
it goes over. We're going to aim for 35. And if we, if we're at 35 minutes and we're just getting to the viewer questions, we're not going to cut out viewer right. questions. We're going to do viewer questions. And if that takes 10 more minutes, we go 10 more minutes. Mm -hmm. But part of the reason we don't do an hour is because of this. There's only so much movie news in a day. And people who watch movie talk tend to like movie talk to be in very short, small mm -hmm. bites. They, they want a topic to be two to three minutes long, maybe four minutes long, right? I don't like that personally. Personally, I'm more of a sports radio guy mm -hmm. where I, like when I drive around, I listen to sports radio. That's what I do. And living in Los Angeles, they talk an insufferable amount about the Lakers in this town. Yes, I'm they not, do. I'm not a Lakers fan. Yes, they fan. do. Um, they talk about the Lakers a lot. But they can bring up a, um, let's say their former player, uh, Pau Gasol, right? Uh. And they could talk about if Pau Gasol will get traded. Mm -hmm. And they will literally talk about it for the half hour that it takes me to get to the – not line. I get in my car to drive to the studio and they're talking about Pau Gasol and if he might get traded and if it's a good idea to trade him. By the time I get to the studio a half hour later, they're still talking about him. We go into the studio, do the show for an hour. I come out to get in my car, drive back, and they're still talking about should they trade Pau Gasol. And they will talk about one topic for hours, five days a week. Because they talked about should we trade Pau Gasol again the next day and then on a later show, whatever. And I like that. Mm -hmm. I like getting a topic and I like – Talking about a topic for 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. But movie talk, we have a certain number of items to get through and people like to have movie talk in short bites. So then when we get to mailbag, I don't care about time. Mm -hmm. You know, if we get a question, I want to talk for nine minutes about topic. That's one of the reasons I love mailbag that we can talk about for nine minutes. Right. On some of these other shows we have starting coming up now, which I'm really excited about, you know, Heroes, if we want to just take one topic and talk about one topic on Heroes, we can. Jedi Council, if we just want to talk about one big Star Wars thing that came up and we all want to talk about it for like 30 or 45 minutes, we can. So for all those other shows, you'll see that. But for Movie Talk, our daily staple show, we're going to continue it for 35 minutes, but we're not going to be constricted to 35 if it happens to go over. So I'm really excited about I'm that. I'm excited too. Michael Pemmett writes, Hello AMC, I love your show and I watch every day. A few days ago, the rap reported that Joel Kinnaman, the killing Robocop, would be replacing Tom Hardy in the upcoming Suicide Squad movie. But you didn't mention it on AMC Movie Talk. Is this true? If so, what are your thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, it did, it did get mentioned. But um, So we'll just go into the second part of your question about what do I think about Joel Kinnaman being cast as uh, cast in, in, uh, in Suicide Squad. I like it. Um, actually, on yesterday's show, I believe it was yesterday's show, we were talking about uh, going into movies with open minds and things like mm -hmm. that. And that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was one of those movies for me that I thought was going to be horrible. And I, I, you go into it with an open mind and mm -hmm. I ended up enjoying it, right? The RoboCop reboot was another one of those. Yeah. I kind of thought, well, this has got stank written all over it. This is going to be terrible. But you check your expectations at the mm -hmm. door. You go in and you watch it with an open mind. And I, while I'm not willing to say it was as good as the original, it wasn't as good as the original, it was still a good movie. And mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of us who came out of that theater at the premiere were all like, that was actually pretty good. I mean, that was all right. That was, all right. And I thought one of the strengths of the film was Joel Kinnaman, who, mm -hmm. who played the lead character. So when I heard about this, I thought, yeah, this makes sense because it's clear. What became clear is that the big A-listers were not interested in that role. Tom Hardy left it. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal turned it down. I, and I've got a feeling there were one or two other people that turned it down too. They were not going to get A-list talent for that role. Why? We don't know yet. We'll, we'll find that out later. And if you can't get a big A-lister, then get a guy who's not real well known, but is super talented. And that's Joel Killen. Mm -hmm. I think he's really good. And so I'm really curious to see how he does in this type of environment. So it was confirmed. When can you like completely say this has been confirmed? Other than the studio being like announcing it. Well, somehow. I think, you know, when the Hollywood Reporter comes out and says, yeah. uh, we've been told this has happened uh -huh. uh, uh, or when the press releases go out or any of that kind of stuff. I don't know if the 100% confirmations come out mm -hmm. on that yet, to be honest. I haven't uh, I haven't looked into it. But um, I, it's pretty much a sure thing at mm -hmm. this point from what I understand. But I'll look into it more. Good Maybe it's still him. a question. Climbing up that ladder. Yeah. Camera Tiller writes, hello, AMC Movie Talk. I've enjoyed this show for some time now and want to congratulate you on your phase three announcements. I am also curious if you will be hosting any more live fan audiences like for the 100 million views party. Just thought it would be fun and interesting. Congrats on expanding. Yeah, we will. Uh, one of the great things about having our own studio is that we can do some live studio audience stuff in yeah. the future if we want. We actually wanted to do 
an Oscar party. I thought we were going to do that. Yeah, we wanted <laughs> to do an Oscar party. We wanted to invite like 50 AMC Movie News yeah. viewers to come in and watch the Oscars. We were all going to get dressed up yeah. and all that kind of stuff and have a really good time, watch the Oscars together and then do our post-Oscar show with a live audience. But we... Number one, the stream.tv wasn't available for us to use mm -hmm. it, and we're, we weren't going to have the studio, our new studio, ready right. in time, which really sucks. It's really unfortunate for that. Um, but we're not going to do it every week. We're not going to do it every month. But we will be doing events where we invite um, movie news viewers to come on down to the studio and participate in a live studio audience type of thing for special stuff. And I'm really excited that we get to Me do that. Me too, because I, the party was so much fun. It was great meeting like a bunch of you guys. Oh, the 100 million party. Yeah, it was so amazing. I was floored. I remember me and Ray, we had a driver bring us to the studio for the party. Mm -hmm. And the driver, pull as we're pulling up Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood, we already saw the lineup I know. going the line around the building. And we were like... Schnapp was oh. like, look out the window. And I was like, is this for us? What yeah, I know. <laughs> like, they all, it was, I, we were floored by how many people showed up. And then, you know, we went to Atlanta yeah. uh, last week. And, and I told them, no, we're not going to do a live show in Atlanta because mm -hmm. we're going to have five people show up and we're going to feel stupid. And like about 100 people showed yeah. up and, and about 100 people more you know, ass said the tickets are sold out. Can we still get in? They called the movie yeah, theater and they I, I tweeted us. It's, all, it's yeah. all over the place. It's like, holy crap. And we had such a good time with the people in Atlanta. It was such fun. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing more stuff like that. It was yeah. just an amazing time. Can't wait to time. meet a bunch of you guys. Yes. But that's all the time we have for today, guys. Thanks so much for joining this episode of Mailbag. And just a reminder, lots of great movies being shown in AMC Theaters today. So go ahead and head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theaters, show times, and ticket information. If you want a podcast version of this episode, check out the description box below. And don't forget to click that subscribe button. Thanks to the guys in the room, Dennis and Jonathan. And thanks to this guy, John Campia. John, where can people will find you online uh, you can find me online on the various social media networks on Facebook and Twitter just at John Campion don't forget the Oscars tonight make sure you're following AMC Movie News on Instagram for all of our short reaction videos we're going to be putting up follow along interact with us mm -hmm. leave your comments on the videos that we put up it's going to be a lot of fun and then watch the after show as well I can't wait and you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley Mova and yeah we'll see you during Oscar festivities Woo! guys bye <laughs>